Hello and welcome back ladies and gentlemen to another historical human's heritage and on today's episode we are referencing our most recent podcast episode on the Mughal Empire where we talked about Humayun, a great Khan. <laughs> yes, I believe technically Humayun was a Shah but he was also a Khan. Uh, it's very confusing as to what title the Mughals used. Uh, however, we're here to talk about his tomb, his final resting place, uh, as it is the first uh, major example of Mughal uh, monumental architecture in India. And I know what everyone is thinking. They're going, wow, that really looks like the Taj Mahal. Well, would you care to explain why that might be, Colm? First of all, it's not. Uh, second of all, uh, this is the building that uh, is the precursor to the Taj Mahal. Uh, it starts the tradition of what are known as uh, garden tombs in India, which is uh, basically how the Mughal emperors uh, chose to bury their dead. Uh, it's a combination of uh, mosque, garden, and final resting place. Um, the uh, Taj Mahal is considered the pinnacle of the construction for this type of architecture. However, this is the one that sort of started the trend. This was the inspiration. This was the masterpiece before the masterpiece. This is the very first one they ever made. And it truly is a masterpiece, too. And I, I made a little bit of a joke before, but this is what the Taj Mahal would have looked like had the British not showed up. Which, yep. the Taj Mahal was encrusted in jewels until the British. Yep. Yeah, you can see it's retained a lot of, uh, a lot of its paint job. Which is honestly gorgeous. Like it's both symmetrical and beautiful. You can see a lot of the Arabic and Muslim inspiration in a lot of the way the arches look. Like the arch is actually a very poignant thing in this style of architecture. Yeah. Um, an architectural historian can tell you why it's poignant. I just know that the pointy arches signify something. It is. Uh, it's very beautiful. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, we also have the lovely uh, traditional domes yeah, the uh, going on here. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Humayun's tomb is located in the city of Delhi. Humayun was the second uh, emperor of the Mughal Empire. And uh, he is the first one to properly unify the various territories the Mughals claimed into a uh, functioning empire. Uh, he's the man who started that. Just... Uh, his tomb... Oh, sorry. No, go on. That's that's uh, a good point. Yeah, yeah no, his tomb here uh, predates the Taj Mahal by 80 years. Uh, the Taj Mahal was built to honor, uh, I believe, his great-grandson's wife. Yes. And um, this specific tomb, uh, Humayun's, was built in the 1560s with the patron of his son, the great Emperor Akbar. Except this yeah. time it wasn't a trap. This yeah. time uh, it was Persian and Indian craftsmen that worked together, which is why you see a lot of Middle Eastern inspiration with a very Indian touch to it. Yeah. But it's uh, quite interesting... It, there's a lot of symbolism with it. It's an example of Charbok, which is a four-quadrant garden with four rivers of Quranic paradise represented. So there's a lot of imagery. They're inter interconnected by channels. It, it There's just a lot of beautiful symm symmetry, symbolism um, to honor the site specifically. Yeah, the, uh, the entire layout of the building is designed to be one giant reference to the, uh, to the Muslim holy book, the Quran. Uh, that, is, uh, that is its primary purpose, as it is, a, it is meant to be a resting place for a dynasty of Muslim rulers. Uh, in India, of all places. Hey, now. Yeah, very fun. Um, one fun thing about this tomb is it is known as the dormitory of the Mughals, as over 150 members of the royal family have been buried in in this uh, in this structure. That's that's a lot of people. 
Uh, well, probably, presumably, under it in the crypts, but yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of people, but a lot of times it's a symbol of power, it's a symbol of prominence, and what ends up making this even more spectacular is after Humayun's death, his son, Emperor Akbar, had a huge, huge period of consolidation and peace that allowed for the building of monumental architecture especially because it's a lot harder to build something like that if your empire is on the brink of failure. Yeah, yeah. Akbar the Great uh, ruled for the uh, first 30 years of his reign, only time the Mughal Empire was ever actually at peace. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the size, the scale, the grandeur, it, there, there is no other precedence for it in the Islamic world. I mean, this is next-level beauty. Yeah, and uh, it, it is it is very clearly um, inspired by the uh, territories which the Mughals uh, took over, like Delhi and Agra, and uh, the uh, monumentality of it is definitely uh, derived from a lot of the Hindu architecture which they would have been witnessing. Uh, the concept of doing something with this much grandeur and this much scale really did not exist yet uh, for the Islamic world. Uh, with this construction. However, on this property actually had older tombs, including that of Barber, which we did talk about in our podcast. His tomb is on the property, along with Nila Gumbad and its garden setting, Is Isa Khan's garden tomb, and other um, 16th century structures, such as Bu Halima's garden tomb and the Asfarwala garden tomb. So there's a lot of other structures and tombs on this property. This one just happened to do it with grandeur. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the first time it was conceived of as a monument rather than a more practical building. I mean, 90% of this structure you do not technically need if you are just burying uh your king. Yeah, you um, just need some sort of slab to say here lies the king RIP. Yes, you know. This was meant to put a point, to be a point. Here lies, yeah, here lies Bali, Lord of Moria. That's all you really need. Whereas here, they wanted to make a point. They wanted to make an effort to show just how important this person was, how much they stand. And their importance is not to be understated because the amount of protections on this site, my oh my. Yeah. Because uh, the site itself is under the management of of the archaeological survey of india and there's a ton of legislation including the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act of 1958 and rules 1959 ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains amendment and validation act 2010 the delhi municipal corporation act of 1957 land acquisition act 1894 and just a, a ton, ton more. I mean, I could keep yeah. going. Yeah, the UNESCO World Heritage actually says and others after listing nine unique regulations dating back almost 70 years. One of them's 1894, so over 100. Yeah. Oh, nice, there's an 1890. Oh, yep, that's right. Under the Land Acquisition Act, which probably set aside the land as an important par parcel that can't be parsed out. Yeah, that is also yeah. You're right. There is the 1801 in there. Good catch, uh, as well as um, as well as a uh, number of conservation projects which uh, have been which have partnered with the site over the years. Uh, most notably, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, which has been uh, maintain helping to maintain the site since 1997. Uh, more specifically, they help work with the gardens and the water flowing into the gardens especially because given its prominence and the aquifer the aqueducts the fountains the water channels being core elements of the garden it's important to to keep it going and to maintain it in in prep in perpetuity yeah not not to mention the incredibly severe uh, severe amount of damage you can do with water if you let something like this uh decay and overflow uh you can you can easily destroy this property just by uh just by letting those canals uh break down 
and that is not something anyone wants. Yeah. So this one's a, an, an interesting one. It ties in with our recent podcast, but it's also just a gorgeous one that I don't think gets the attention it it quite frankly deserves. Yeah, it is. It is the original, and it does get overshadowed by the much larger uh, Taj Mahal, which is the pinnacle of this type of architecture, but. Like the Step Pyramid of Egypt, sometimes seeing the very first one is just as awe-inspiring. Which, especially, I... when you, especially when you consider that prior to this, no one had any concept of ever building something like this. This is something that took vision. I also do want to clarify we speak from the Western world. I'm sure in India and in other parts of Southeast Asia, this is more well-known. Yeah, yeah, but like... As far as international fame goes, this does not have the rank it deserves, and I don't think uh, I don't think anyone's going to dispute us on that. That this does not get the love it deserves. <laughs> but yeah, on that note, thank you guys for watching. We'll see y'all in the next video. Peace.